Professor McPherson, um, I have some questions I wanted to ask you about your professional title. And uh, you're, because you're often accused of not being a climate change scientist, but uh, isn't that a fairly new degree in uh, the university world? Absolutely. No, I do not have a degree in climate science. And guess what? James Hansen doesn't either. And guess what? Michael Mann doesn't either. Those are the two best known climate scientists, climate scientists in the country and probably in the world. From their own CVs, which you can find online, James Hansen's degrees, all of which come from the University of Iowa, are Bachelor of Arts, Physics and Mathematics, Master of Science in Astronomy, and a PhD in Physics. None of those, you'll notice, is climate science. Michael Mann's degrees from University of California, Berkeley, and AB in Applied Math and Physics, from Yale, where he got his master's and PhD, master's in physics and PhD in geology and geophysics. None of those say climate science. In fact, when I left active service at the University of Arizona in 2008, the University of Arizona, which is, is, is one of the leading universities in terms of climate change research, they had recently agreed to a PhD minor in climate science. That's it. That's a, so there's no degree, there's no major you can get at any level at that time. I don't know if they've changed that. I doubt if they have. But at the time, they had a PhD minor in climate science. So my degrees, I have a bachelor's degree in forestry, forest science specifically, from, that's a bachelor of science degree at the University of Idaho. And then my Master of Science and my PhD are both in range science at Texas Tech University. If you want, I can ramble on about Texas Tech University and, and what it means to have a range science degree. Right, I don't talk about my climate science degree because I don't have one. And I've never said that I have a degree in climate science. And I'm frequently accused of not having a degree in climate science. I never said I did. So I don't know where that accusation comes from. Oh, and by the way, James Hansen doesn't have a degree in climate science either. Oh, and by the way, Michael Mann doesn't either. And almost nobody in the world has a degree, maybe a minor, but not a degree in climate science. So don't yell at me for not having a degree in climate science. It doesn't make any sense at all. My master's and PhD degrees from Texas Tech University are both in range science. And I don't mention that very often, even though they're science-oriented degrees from a serious significant university. One of, one of people's favorite climate scientists to turn to is Catherine Hayhoe, who is at Texas Tech University. Anyway, I don't talk about my range science degrees very often because most people don't know what that is. That is. They, they think that it comes about from spending a lot of time in the kitchen working on the range. No, that's not it. Or they think I must know a lot about livestock. And, and in fact, I didn't study much about livestock when I was working on my master's or PhD. The reason I went to Texas Tech University was because the world's leading authority on fire ecology at that time was a professor there and department head in the Department of Range Science and Wildlife Science, Range, Wildlife and Fishery Science. And his name was Henry a. Wright, and he had relatively recently written what was for many years the leading text on fire ecology. He wrote it with a guy named Art Bailey from Canada. And it was called Fire Ecology of the United States and Southern Canada, I think. In, in any event, Henry Wright was the world's leading authority on fire ecology and fire management at the time. And that's why I went to school at Texas Tech. Actually, funny story, if you're into that sort of thing. It was probably October of 1982, and I'm about to graduate. 
in December of 1982 from the University of Idaho with my degree in forest science. And it occurs to me that since the Reagan administration had been in office for a couple of years, that there was no chance I was going to get a job as a forester. In fact, the Federal Register was closed for forestry. You couldn't even apply for a federal job as forester in the federal government in the United States. So I'm thinking, yes, I was really that delayed in thinking about my future. I'm walking down the hall, it's probably October, I'm gonna graduate in December, and I'm thinking to myself, I wonder if I should go to graduate school. And I had no real idea what graduate school was, except that I lived for uh, about a year in college with a person who was going to graduate school, who was getting his graduate degree with Leon Neuenschwander, who was my undergraduate academic advisor. So he was, Leon Neuenschwander had received his PhD working with Henry Wright at Texas Tech University. So he was a pretty well-known fire ecologist at this point and also prescribed burning specialist. And one of my college roommates was pursuing his master's degree with Leon Neuenschwander. In addition, that particular individual who was my college roommate for about a year had been my supervisor when I worked for the Idaho Department of Lands as a firefighter, as a smoke chaser. And so this guy, Brian, was influential for me. In fact, I went my first two years of undergraduate school, I went to Idaho State University because it was the state university furthest from my parents. And I wanted to escape them at all costs. Like so many children who are 18 years old, I just wanted to get away from my parents and prove that I was an adult. So I was going to Idaho State University and in the summertime, I was living in Craigmont, Idaho with my parents and working for the Idaho, De Idaho Department of Lands as a smoke chaser. And Brian was my supervisor in that position. So he could tell that I was not a serious college student. And so one day he pulled me off to the side and he said something like, why don't you just knock off that bullshit you're doing? Why don't you get an actual degree, like in forestry, something that you're interested in, and maybe turn your life around a little bit? Well, that was real slap in the face for me until I realized that he was exactly right, that I was majoring in women and basketball, and I wasn't any good at basketball, and I wasn't all that swift at women, for that matter. So, so he was right, and I transferred to the University of Idaho, picked up Leon Neuenschwander as my undergraduate advisor. Leon was Brian's graduate advisor for the pursuit of his Master of Science degree. And ultimately that led to this undergraduate degree. Anyway, I'm walking down the hall in October of 1982, going to graduate in December of 1982, and I see a flyer on the bulletin board, right? This is 1982, so it's before the internet was announcing all of the, all of the graduate positions. And it was for, for work on fire ecology at Northern Arizona University. And so I took it off the board so that nobody else would see it, so I knew how to get rid of the competition. And I took it into Lee, Leon Neuenschwanner and I said, Leon, I think I want to go to graduate school. You know, having thought about it now for five minutes, I decided that was the thing to do. And he says, well, all right, but don't go to NAU because that's not a very good school. And it wasn't a major research university. So he said, why don't I just give Henry a call and see if he's taking any students? Well, I was beside myself because Henry Wright at the time was a god amongst us undergraduate students who were studying fire ecology. This is somebody who only appears in books and short films and that kind of thing. So this is a big deal that, that Leon was calling Henry Wright. So I sat there at his desk while he made the phone call. And he said, Henry, do you need, need any more graduate students? Because I have a good one for you right here. And so I talked to Henry Wright on the phone for about 10 minutes. And that's 
when and how I committed to getting graduate degrees at Texas Tech. And Henry made it perfectly clear that he was interested only in students for the long term. He didn't want somebody who's going to get a master's degree and then move on to another university. Later, I realized that probably would have been the better route for me. And that's what I recommend for most students, in fact. But I committed to a master's and PhD because once Henry found a good student, he wanted to keep him around for a while because it was the students who really ran the prescribed fire program at Texas Tech, where we were lighting prescribed fires up to 10,000, no, up to 20,000 acres in size. That's a lot. If you're, if you're measuring that in hectares, that's a lot. <laughs> Can't do the math in my head anymore. In any event, so I talked to Henry on the phone. I committed to getting a master's and PhD, and I drove down there that January to start my graduate career. When I arrived at the University of Georgia, I was in the Institute for Ecology. That's the building I was in because that's a building my supervisor, Susan Power Bratton, was in. She had received her PhD working with renowned plant community ecologist Robert Whitaker. And right down the hall from me was a guy named Eugene Odom, one of the premier ecologists of the time. And he was pretty old at that time, but he was still coming into work every day. And I had a couple of occasions to chat with him, sit down and chat with him in his office for a half an hour or an hour. And at the time, this is the kind of thing that would send shivers down the spine of anybody who'd been studying ecology in graduate school for any length of time. So that was pretty exciting for me. So it's pretty interesting. I was reading John McPhee's book, Encounters with the Arch Druid when I was in the process of wrapping up my PhD. Encounters with the Arch Druid is comprised of three stories. I read it a long time ago, so I might get some of the details wrong. One of the, one of the three stories, and, and also one of the three chapters, was called A River, and it describes the Arch Druid, David Brower, writing down the Colorado River in a raft with Floyd Dominey. And as I recall, Floyd Dominey at the time was the head of the Bureau of Reclamation, which we affect, affectionately referred to as the Bureau of Rec the Nation, but it's Bureau of Reclamation. And so this was the strategy. This is what John McPhee did. He set up three different relatively long-term occasions, a couple of weeks. One with Floyd Dominey in a chapter called The River, and he's floating down the river, John McPhee, the writer, with David Brower, the renowned ecologist and conservationist. And David Brower went along with all three of these rides. So it was David Brower, that's the arch druid, and John McPhee, and one of the renowned people on the other side when we're talking about central issues. So the river had Floyd Dominey, the, the mountain, which took place in North Cascades National Park, involved a mining engineer, as I recall, somebody who wanted to mine every little bit of copper or any other element from the planet so that we can continue to keep the lights on. And David Brower had a conversation with him over the span of a couple of weeks, and John McPhee was just a recorder. Well, the third chapter in that book was called The Island, and it was taking place on Cumberland Island, the southernmost of Georgia's barrier islands off the southeastern coast of Georgia. And I was reading that chapter when Susan Bratton called me and asked if I was interested in doing postdoctoral research on Cumberland Island. Now, the, the, the person with whom John McPhee and David Brower were speaking on that trip was the guy, I can't remember his name, he developed Hilton Head in South Carolina, turned this beautiful border of the, of the sea and the mainland, turned it into what had been a beautiful oak forest dominated ecosystem into a golf course filled with resorts. And he wanted to do the same thing at Cumberland Island. 
and it was working great. In fact, it looked like it was gonna happen. And then the poor slobs showed up at a Kennedy family wedding. It was the Kennedy Carnegie family that owned the entire island. And he showed up and spread out the blueprints at the wedding reception to show what he was gonna do. Well, the Kennedy Carnegie family got so irritated at that, they just gave the land, gave the whole island to the park service. So, so that didn't go well from the developer's perspective. And thus, and it was all wilderness, except for a one square mile of area called High Point on the island that was given to the residents for the next 99 years. And this was, I believe, in December 1974 when the transition was made. So if we had that long, the private property would turn over and become part of the Cumberland Island National Wilderness Area, or it's called Cumberland Island National Seashore. It would become part of Cumberland Island National Seashore in 99 years after December of 1974. In any event, that was the deal. So, so this guy showed up at the Kennedy Carnegie family wedding, put out the plans. The family decided, no way. And so they gave it to the Park Service. And Susan Bratton was interested in figuring out why the boundaries between plant communities changed relatively abruptly over the span of years or decades. And so that was my mission, was to do my postdoctoral research trying to figure that out. And I came up with a pretty good story about it that led to a couple of publications. But that's not the story for today. While on Cumberland Island conducting my research, I was assigned and was interested in why do the boundaries between plant communities move and why do they move so rapidly? What regulates the establishment and maintenance of one plant community compared to another? So I decided the, the relevant plant communities to work on and the boundaries between them were oak forests. So there's this live oak forest there dominated by Quercus virginianus, which is a scientific name with Spanish moss hanging off of all these beautiful, large trees. And in some places, there was a relatively sharp boundary between the oak forest here and the freshwater marsh here. So freshwater marsh, notice this is a barrier island, so it's out in the ocean, out in the Atlantic Ocean. But there was this lens of fresh water that provided drinking water for the people who live there and also habitat for freshwater organisms. Anyway, the boundary between the oak trees here and the marsh, the freshwater marsh here, was relatively facile. It, was, it would move over relatively short periods of time as indicated by remote photography, airborne photographs taken on relatively sh at relatively short intervals. Now, there was also this plant community called scrub, dominated by ericaceous plants. And that's very similar to er ericaceous, meaning in the ericaceae family. And that's a, a plant community that you can, found in place, can find in places like chaparral, California chaparral or Arizona chaparral. And in Europe, they call it by another name that I forget now, but in a relatively large scale sense, there is this sh scrub plant community that is dominated by a bunch of woody plants that don't get to tree height. In any event, the boundary between the oak trees, the tall statuesque oak trees and the scrub, as we called it, was also relatively dynamic. Why could that be? Now, Susan contacted me because of two reasons. She thought I had expertise in fire, in fire ecology, which I did because that's why I went to graduate school. And because I was getting a degree in range science, she assumed I had an understanding of grazing, whether it's livestock grazing or other animals grazing, in, invertebrates for that matter. It doesn't really matter. She just thought that that factor, the livestock, 
probably was contributing to the movement of these boundaries between plant communities at a relatively short period of time. So I did a bunch of research, a bunch of historical research, looking at aerial photographs, um, looking at changes in water depth over time, and concluded, without doing an experiment, without having the ability to do an experiment, because we just didn't have time to actually identify this as the causal factor, uh, I determined that probably the story could be explained by relatively large-scale short-term and long-term weather patterns, most notably precipitation. So this freshwater lens that was under this island, under the surface of this island, if it came up a little bit from a series of wet years, then that would favor the marshes and the abundant number of oak trees that died coincident with that increase in precipitation indicates that the oak trees were not well adapted. They were suffering from physiological drought or not getting enough oxygen to their roots. So that probably explained why the oak trees were dying. And it was a similar story with the boundary between the oak trees and the scrub. The scrub was better adapted to rapidly altering groundwater conditions than the oak trees were. So that's the short version of that story, which, as I think about it, wasn't very short. <laughs> but anyway, Susan Bratton, at the time, was in the process of transitioning from a professor in plant ecology, and more generally, a professor and Cooperative Park Studies unit leader in ecology, very generally stated, because she supervised postdocs and graduate students and worked with faculty who were studying animals as well as plants. She was in the process of, tra of transitioning to a religious studies professor position, and that's what she does now. She had been reading multiple versions of the Bible, the Christian Bible in, in its various forms, and uh, and she was also a, she would be considered a very spiritual person. And so she was in the process of making this transition. It was shortly after I received my postdoctoral status with her that she went on to become a professor of religious studies. And I suspect she's still doing that work. Anyway, I didn't last very long in the postdoc because I was offered a professor position. So I went to Texas A&M University as a visiting assistant professor. It was a two-year position with potential, if, if I served well enough, to turn into another two years. So visiting assistant professor, and it had a relatively large teaching load. That large teaching load was pivotal for me. One of the classes I was teaching had 400 students, about 150 in the morning class, the 9 a.m. class, and about 250 in the early afternoon class, because nobody wants to get up at 9 o'clock in the morning when they're a college student just to go to a class. So there's so twice a day, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I'd be for an hour, 50 minutes, I'd be facing 150 to 250 students. And there was this unspoken rule at Texas A&M University that you pick up the daily campus newspaper on the way into class. And if the professor is not holding your interest, you just pick it up and start reading. And there are a few things that provide more motivation to capture the attention of your students than staring up at, at 150 newspapers. So, that's when I learned to become, that's when I would learn to develop my act in stand-up tragedy. Because what I was telling with respect to environmental stories was tragedy. So I received my PhD in 1987, went in late 1987 to the University of Georgia and spent most of my time there 
actually on Cumberland Island. Drive six hours down to the coast, spend two or three weeks on Cumberland Island collecting data, collecting samples, drive back up, spend a week or so analyzing the data collected to this point. And then in spring of 1988, was offered the position at Texas Tech, sorry, at Texas A&M University. It's pretty interesting because as I was wrapping up my PhD research, I thought I really want a job that is either working for the federal government or for the university as a professor. And I'll take the, that job anywhere in the United States except the South. I had this aversion to the South that was rooted in prejudice because I'd never spent any significant amount of time there. And so then what happens? I do my postdoctoral research in what almost anybody would consider the Deep South, Athens, Georgia, and Cumberland Island in the extreme southeastern Georgia. And as I'm there, I'm thinking, okay, I need to be more specific. The South isn't so bad after all. At this point, I'm willing to take any professor position as long as it's not at Texas A&M University because I'd received my master's and PhD degrees at Texas Tech. Texas A&M was the big rival, so I didn't want to go there. I just had this deeply seated, unfounded hatred of Texas A&M University. And so, of course, that's where I was offered the faculty position, my first professori, professorial position. So, finished, wrapped up the postdoc position in spring of 88, went to College Station and Texas A&M University in ni late 1988, August probably, to prepare for the semester, and then spent the fall of 1988, spring of 1989 working there, and then as of May 1st, 1989, began working at Tucson, Arizona, at the University of Arizona in my first tenure track position. So one academic year in this visiting assistant professor position, before that, a few months, maybe eight or nine months altogether, working on postdoc, and before that, the PhD and master's that I wrapped up in four years, four and a half years altogether for both of those degrees. So then I started May 1st, 2000, sorry, May 1st, 1989 at the University of Arizona and stayed there for 20 years with various disruptions along the way. So I left active service on the campus of the University of Arizona, May 1st, 2009. I chose that day specifically because in the rest of the world, with the glaring exception of the United States, May 1st is the day we honor and celebrate workers. 20 years at the University of Arizona. So to circle back, I'm not a climate scientist. I call, my, I call myself a conservation biologist because from the time I started working on my master's degree at Texas Tech University and all the way through that master's degree and my postdoc and my time at Texas A&M and my time at the University of Arizona, I was interested in conservation biology. Now there was no degree and really no existence academically of conservation biology in 1987 when I received my degree at Texas Tech University, my PhD degree. In fact, it was 1987 that the Society for Conservation Biology was established, and I believe it was 1989 when they published their first journal called Conservation Biology. So I didn't know about the existence of a formal organization because there wasn't one of any significance. So I wasn't a, I didn't call myself a conservation biologist when I graduated with my PhD degree from Texas Tech University. However, at the time, the Range, Wildlife, and Fishery Science Department at the Texas Tech University had this really interesting mix of people from all over the world. There were graduate students from Africa. There were graduate students, there was some sort of pipeline that went from the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point straight to Texas Tech University. So I worked with all these interesting characters from all over the world. 
And there was a significant influence of the Nature Conservancy at the time as well. And one of my best friends who I spent many, many thousands of hours in the field with was a guy named Jeff who worked for the Nature Conservancy before going back to get his master's degree. And then he worked for the Nature Conservancy afterward too. And I suspect he's still working for the Nature Conservancy somewhere in Texas. Although he's from Wisconsin when he came to Texas. I transitioned from a um, shit-kicking cowboy of sorts, which, which is what people think about people who have a degree in range science, the ones who don't think it's about ovens. I transitioned from that point, and really the whole time I was interested in considerably more than raising red meat for the populace. I never focused on the animal side of the story. I was always focused on plant community ecology. And that, in fact, when I was working on my master's and especially when I was working on my PhD, that's when I began studying climate change, mostly paleoclimate change. Why was there this sudden eruption of ponderosa pine in the, about 1920 in the Southwest United States. Why was that? So I got to looking at that and matching up plant, large scale plant ecology patterns, plant community patterns with paleoclimatic factors. And that came heavily into play, as I indicated when I was working on my postdoctoral research on Cumberland Island. It's all about the precipitation, or at least it seemed to be. I became interested in the linkage between climate factors, especially in the past, and what's going on with plant communities right now today. So I began digging into the historical precipitation and temperature records, which in this country go back many, many decades. And so that played an important role in my postdoctoral research at the University of Georgia as well. And so I just kept studying climate change. And then I remember one of my first slides I had created for teaching at Texas A&M Texas University was a cover shot from, I think, Time Magazine that showed Yellowstone on fire due to the monster fire in 1988, summer of 1988 there. And that obviously was affected by climate change, although nobody was studying climate change closely enough to to make that link at the time. So it was relatively early on in my academic career that I was focusing on climate change without really understanding that there was this burgeoning discipline known as climate science. It really was struggling to find its way at that point. So that by the time I got to my tenure track position, on May 1st, 1989 at the University of Arizona, I had already been studying climate change and historically important climatic events in the past and how they influence plant communities. So it wasn't a big deal when I got to the University of Arizona and my research and that of my graduate students and postdocs and undergraduate techs was influenced by and was directly studying climate change. One of my early PhD students did one of the first, I think it was among the three first rain out shelter experiments. And what we did was identify some relatively large areas and put rain out shelters over the top and then apply various treatments underneath that big rain out shelter. We used chain link fence panels, big chain link fence panels to make this above ground tent. It started about four feet off the ground so the air movement can go underneath and so that we could go underneath and add precipitation treatments of various kinds to these relatively large plots in the ground. We separated the plots from the existing ground by, by digging trenches all the way around these plots and putting plastic down on the ground to separate them. It's really quite a monumental effort. We were interested in what kinds of factors influence the relationship between 
oak seedlings and the germination of those seedlings and the native grasses around them. That was early on in my research at the University of Arizona and ultimately led to a book published by the University of Arizona Press with that same graduate student, the two of us editing. That book came out in 2003, so we were working on it throughout 2002, soliciting people to write the chapters, putting together those chapters in some sort of meaningful order, interacting with the chapter authors to make sure that there were links between the chapters, and that led to the publication of this book on climate change in 2003. So that book that I worked on with this graduate student of mine came to be known as Changing Precipitation Regimes and Terrestrial Ecosystems, A North American Perspective. Yes, I know you can read it as well as I can. It was edited by my PhD student, Jake Weltzine, and I, and it had chapters including uh, some introductory stuff, and then the interface between precipitation and vegetation, the importance of soils in arid and semi-arid environments. So we're interested in soils and soil plant relations, responses of woody plants to heterogeneity of soil water in arid and semi-arid environments. So again, soil, water, plant interactions were key here. The importance of pre precipitation seasonality in controlling vegetation distribution in this chapter was contributed by a guy named Ron Nielsen, who at the time was the renowned modeler, among the best known modelers in the world for what future climates were going to look like. And as a result, what future vegetation patterns would look like. Approaches and techniques of rainfall manipulation. So we tracked down everybody who was doing the kind of work that Jake and I were doing with rainout shelters, altering the precipitation. We tracked down the other people who were doing research on that as well and, and had them write chapters. Ecological consequences of drought and grazing on grasslands of the Northern Great Plains. And rainfall timing, soil moisture dynamics, plant responses, response of eastern deciduous forest to precipitation chain, change, and so on. And Jake Weltzine and I, and Jake went on to become a well-known professor and first director of the National Phenology Network of the United States. Another student who I advised is currently the director of the National Phenology Network. In any event, so I worked with these people who went on to do good things. And that book was, in, in editing that book and reading through all the chapters, it was then that I came to the conclusion that we're done. So by 1983, as a result of putting together all this work and reading all these different perspectives, that's when I concluded, but could not say absolutely could not say to anybody that climate change was going to destroy habitat for humans on the planet in the not too distant future. And that time I thought we wouldn't make it until 2030. There's nothing, there's no single bit of evidence pointing to that. There's no significant overall study that says that's what's going to happen. Certainly not in 2003. But that's the conclusion I reached. I couldn't speak about it without fear of getting my career chopped off. I mean, my head chopped off. <laughs> and so I didn't. By 1983, as a result of putting together all this work and reading all these different perspectives, that's when I concluded, but could not say, absolutely could not say to anybody that climate change was going to destroy habitat for humans on the planet in the not too distant future. And that time I thought we wouldn't make it until 2030. There's nothing, there's no single bit of evidence pointing to that. There's no significant overall study that says that's what's going to happen. Certainly not in 2003. But that's the conclusion I reached. I couldn't speak about it without fear of getting my career chopped off. I mean, my head chopped off. <laughs> and so I didn't until 2007. 
And then I started talking about it more openly and that didn't go well. And that ultimately led to my departing the University of Arizona voluntarily, by the way, in 2009, May 1st, 2009. So that's the story so far. After I left the University of Arizona, I became better known for my work on abrupt irreversible climate change. And because of that work on abrupt irreversible climate change, I was deplatformed with a coordinated defamation campaign that almost certainly was rooted in the United States mm, surveillance security network, we'll say. And that led to my being completely disappeared. That was it's about five years ago that that defamation campaign peaked and made me persona non grata, unable to speak on tour since then or reach a significant number of people. It's interesting because years later, 2018 and 2019, the IPCC, one of the more conservative bodies in the history of the planet, one of the more political bodies operating under the auspices of being a scientific panel, concluded that climate change is abrupt and irreversible. And as nearly as I can tell, nobody working on behalf of the IPCC has been called a sexual predator and had their public life completely destroyed. I reached the conclusion a little bit sooner than they did. As Robert Heinlein, the science fiction writer from the United States, who wrote something like, being right too soon is socially inconvenient, something like that. And so I reached this conclusion and began speaking and writing about this conclusion that, that we had entered the arena of abrupt irreversible climate change that threatened habitat for our species on this planet. I reached that conclusion in 2003. I was talking about it quite openly, not so long after that. And then years later, along comes the IPCC and concludes the same thing and nobody wants to destroy their lives. Nobody is reaching out to anybody working on those reports for the IPCC and calling them sexual predators. Nobody is reaching those people and saying, no, that can't possibly be right because I have too much con convenience in my life to lose if it is. Yet when I was talking about, when I reached that conclusion many years before the IPCC did, I was the worst person on the planet. You know, it's interesting. Michael Mann concluded in a paper in Nature in 1999 that we had entered the arena of abrupt climate change, and that's what was headed. This, that's where the hockey stick idea came from. And several years later, he had a child. Well, his wife had a child. And so he's the father of a child in any event. How could you reach that conclusion that we're headed for this abrupt climate change and not also conclude that that's going to have consequences for human beings on this planet? How could you reach that conclusion and then go have it children? Maybe it has to do with the fact that Michael Mann has degrees in applied math, physics, geology, and geophysics. Maybe that's why. Because if you don't understand the first thing about conservation biology, about the pillars of conservation biology, speciation, extinction, and habitat, maybe you decide that humans are so good we can do anything, that we can survive anything, that we can literally do anything. Maybe that's the conclusion you reach. Maybe that's why you have children at a relatively late age knowing for years that we are we have entered the arena of the hockey stick of very abrupt climate change. I don't know. It's crazy. It seems crazy to me. And that's what I've been called. My ideas have been called crazy by James Hansen, and I've been called crazy and way worse by Michael Mann. Guy McPherson is very pessimistic about humans surviving even 10 more years on the planet. What do you think? I think that's crazy. Uh, we're, 
You can't kill people that easily. The transition from range science to conservation biology for me was relatively straightforward because I was in this graduate program that had a bunch of conservation biologists in it. Nobody called themselves that because nobody was using that term, or at least very few people were using that term, conservation biology, conservation biologist. So people were not using that term to describe themselves, and I certainly wasn't either. But I was working with people who were interested in the natural world, who were interested in conserving genetic variation, who were interested in conserving what we have left of the beauty of this planet. So I was interested in that from the time I was a kid. I grew up in, as, as a lot of people know who are watching this, I grew up in a town of about 700 people called Weipe, Idaho, in northern Idaho, known only if you've seen Ken Burns' documentary, The Core of Discovery, because Lewis and Clark in The Core of Discovery first encountered the Nez Perce Indians on the Weipe Prairie, in the place that was to become Weipe, Idaho. And it was there that the Nez Perce Indians saved the lives of Lewis and Clark and the Corps of Discovery by feeding them salmon from the, from the Clearwater River. The salmon was so rich that the members of the Corps would eat it, just engorge themselves on it, and then throw up and experience dysentery and then start eating more because they were starving, having crossed the Rocky Mountains in, in what was at the time a relatively biologically depauperate area. So relatively little food, they were starving to death when they got to the Weite Prairie and were saved. I suspect the Nez Perce tribe would have changed their mind about that if they had a chance later. But anyway, so I grew up in the small town. I was in the world. I was in the natural world every day. Every summer day, I was out playing in the stream that ran through town, Lolo Creek. I was out there playing in the woods. I was chasing snakes and seeing the natural world in what at the time was a beautiful condition. I grew up hunting and fishing with my mom and dad, going out every summer day to fish in the streams, and that's how we fed ourselves. We had a single income family. My dad was making very little money as a teacher, a public school teacher, and then a principal, and then a superintendent. And so we shot or caught most of our food. Deer, elk, lots of game birds, grouse, chucker, pheasants, so on, and lots of trout caught out of small streams in the summertime and then put in the freezer by my mom pretty much as soon as we got home. And that's what fed us all winter long was the, the animals we shot or we caught. I didn't know any, any different so I thought everybody in the world was getting along this way. I thought everybody had baking powder biscuits every night for dinner for a month because, because their mom messed up the finances. And so we had to eat the least expensive food possible for an entire month. <laughs> I thought everybody was eating deer and elk, the occasional bear. I didn't know any different. And then I get to college and discovered that food can actually be really good, dorm food. And, and later I discovered there was this thing called veganism and even vegetarianism, which was new to me. Vegetarianism, are you kidding me? You don't even eat rainbow trout? How could that be? <laughs> ah, lovely times. Difficult times as well. It's interesting, there, there are environmental studies majors and there are environmental science majors. And the first thing I would recommend is to run to the sciences and away from the studies. Because studies can mean almost anything depending upon who's teaching the class. I was interested in, in studying women when I was an undergraduate 
but we didn't even have a women's studies department, much less a curriculum. Similarly, environmental studies can mean almost anything, depending upon the teacher who is teaching the material. That's why I would recommend pursuing sciences, because science is not just another way of viewing the world. Science conducted correctly leads to what is called reliable knowledge. And that reliable knowledge gives us an understanding of the universe and how it works. I can't imagine pursuing a degree today, having the opportunity to pursue a scientific, otherwise known as a rational approach, and not doing it. Instead, pursue something that sounds kind of the same, but is really very different. Environmental studies is not environmental science. If you're interested in a rational approach, a rational approach to understanding the world and the universe and the way the world and the universe work, then I would recommend pursuing a science degree of one kind or another. Environmental science, whatever. But, but most importantly, chuck all that aside for a minute. I would recommend doing what you love, pursuing what you love, whether it's in college or not. Because our time is short, do what you love, do it well. In a culture of mediocrity, I would recommend the pursuit of excellence. Not because it will improve your material status in life, not because it will make you any money, but because it will allow you to live with integrity. And if there's anything more important than living with integrity, I haven't found it yet. There's a huge difference between excellence and perfection. We can all pursue excellence. Essentially, none of us will reach perfection. We can pursue perfection knowing that we are never going to get there. That's called the pursuit of excellence. We make mistakes along the way. If you want a complete list, look at my life history. <laughs> if you want to know what things to avoid, including walking away from a perfectly good, tenured, full professor position where I literally didn't have to do anything except teach the courses I want and pursue the research I want and advise the students I want to advise, well then, don't follow my route, obviously. So that was a huge mistake. I'm still interested in pursuing excellence. Perfection is a little beyond my grasp, as I've demonstrated repeatedly. Perfection is beyond the grasp of most, probably all of us, but excellence is not. And the pursuit of excellence doesn't mean that you're gonna catch the damn thing. That's like the dog that chases after the car every time. The dog's not gonna catch the car. You're not gonna catch excellence, at least not all the time. That doesn't mean you shouldn't pursue it. Do, what, do the right thing, do what is right, pursue excellence, do the best you can without hurting people and, and the whole time maintaining your integrity. What else could be more important than that? If there is something, I don't know what it is.